Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Good Hormone Health webinar. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so tonight's webinar is entitled Dr. Friedman's Guide to Weight Loss Medications and Wellness. Uh, the outline for tonight's talk is, first of all, who should go on weight loss medications, which may, weight loss medications are the best, what are the side effects, how do they work with diet and exercise, how do you get insurance coverage, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Rabbi Maimonides' Guide to Wellness, and I'm going to talk about a, uh, a website, an app called Levels. Uh, my uh, focus of uh, the talk and the general my talk is always on health and wellness. Um, and the way I try to uh, see weight loss and obesity is first of all, to rule out endocrine problems as an endocrinologist, such as hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome, or growth hormone deficiency that may lead to weight gain. Simultaneously, I encourage the patient to consume a low calorie diet. I often recommend eating a large quantity of vegetables. Vegetables are low in calories with a lot of nutrition, as well as to try to increase your, uh, your exercise in general, just to get out and move. Uh, get a good night's sleep is crucial. Good mental health is very important and avoid stress or at least don't let uh, stress get to you. Um, I often recommend my patients to use an app like Lose It or My Fitness Pal to track calories. Um, I did this uh, several years ago and it was very helpful to see what kind of foods have a certain amount of calories, how much I'm eating per day. And then it sort of guides you, do you really need to eat this um, snack late at night uh, to push you over your limit of your calories? Um, these are often helpful. They're not the only thing, but um, these are uh, a good approach also to, for people to see how much calories they're consuming and what kind of foods have higher calories. And every of my patients all say, I've done that all before. Um, I'm usually not the first doctor that's brought up weight loss with them. Most of them have already tried this, uh, unfortunately, um, and without success. Um, I still encourage people to do it. Um, you should never, you can never do enough of healthy diet and exercise. Uh, many people say they don't eat too much. They eat pretty healthy. Um, so that's where, where medicines come in. Um, and many patients need a jump start for weight loss. This is where weight loss medicines come into play. And I often prescribe weight loss medicines after other endocrine conditions are either diagnosed and treated or at least ruled out. And one of the, my very life's uh, changing uh, meetings that I was at this year in Atlanta, the Endocrine Society meeting, I went to a lecture on obesity. The person who gave the lecture, I think was from Cornell in New York, and pointed out that only 2% of patients with obesity are on weight loss medications. Um, and you can imagine if only 2% of people with diabetes are on diabetes medicines, or 2% of patients with high blood pressure are on hypertension, anti-hypertensive medications. So I think the question is, you know, why is it such a low percentage of people uh, are on obesity medicines? And uh, there's several answers, um, maybe some other ones beside this, but doctors frequently don't prescribe them. Um, doctors unrealistically view that if obese patients have more willpower, they could lose weight. Uh, the medicines are for the most part costly. Um, they're not covered often by insurance or have difficult pre-authorization requirements that discourage doctors from giving it to them. And they hear the medicines can have a lot of side effects. So the weight loss medicines are uh, are not uh, are not certainly not without side effects, but I still think in general, in spite of all these, they're underutilized and they're a valuable tool to go along with lifestyle changes. So this is an outline of the different types of weight loss medicines that I'm going to talk about today. The first, there's two main categories. Um, one category is the stimulants, uh, fentramine, which I'll talk a lot about, fentametrazine, tenuate which I don't use one, much, uh, one called Cosima, which is fentamine plus Topramax. The main category that's so sort of new that we're gonna spend a fair amount of time tonight on is the gl receptor agonist. This includes Ozempic, which is um, generic as semiglutite, Rubelsis, which is an oral version of semiglutite, Wagovi, which is semiglutite approved for weight loss, Monjuro, which is a fairly new one called terzapatide, Liraglutide, uh, which is Victosa sexenda, and Delaglutide Trulicity, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't use it too much. There's other ones. One is called Contrave. This is not Trexone plus Bupropion. There's Orlistat, which is, which is generic, is called Ali. And the medicine Belvic or Locarcerin was removed in the market in 2020 due to increased rates of cancer. 
So we'll start with fentramine. Fentramine is also called Adipex P, Suprenza. Um, it comes in 15, 30, and 37.5 milligram tablets. It also comes in capsules. Um, so you have a fair amount of choice for this. Uh, it was part of the combination medicine called Fenfen. Fenfen was removed from the market in 1997 due to the fenfluoramine in it have giving heart problems and lung problems. The fentramine has been used for 50 years, the fen with the pH, and is quite safe. Um, it is a uh, stimulant. It's about $40 a month, so it's pretty inexpensive compared to the other medicines. It's approved for short-term loss, usually two to four months. I sometimes push it out to six months. Some people can do even longer on it, but it's not really approved for long-term use. Um, it does decrease one's appetite and may have some effects on increasing metabolism. It's in the family of amphetamine-like drugs. Um, the side effects include, you know, things you'd expect from amphetamine-like drugs, hyper jittery, rapid heartbeat, increased uh, blood pressure, some people get anxiety, trouble sleeping is quite common, uh, urinary retention can happen. Um, and this medicine, I think, is underutilized. It's not too expensive. It works well at a low cost. I usually start with a half a pill at lunch and dinner. If somebody gets insomnia, I move it to earlier in the day. Sometimes they'll give a full pill in the morning, a, full, a half a pill at lunch and at breakfast and lunch, maybe just a half a pill in the morning. Um, but, you know, most people eat more at lunch and dinner, so I usually start at that. And I usually give this for a period of two to six months. It's long-term use is not uh, clarified. If somebody keeps on losing weight after six months, I would continue it, but often it starts losing its effect. Another medicine, which I, I like a lot, um, is called fendametrazine. It's also called Bontrol. Um, there's both the immediate release, which is 35 milligrams, and the slow release, which is 105 milligrams. Um, it's pretty inexpensive also for about a month's supply, either the slow release or the immediate release. It's about $33. Um, it decreases your appetite. It may have some effect on increasing metabolism. It's also an amphetamine-like drug. Common side effects include dry mouth is quite common, dizziness, vomiting, difficulty sleeping, insomnia, irritability, nauseousness, diarrhea, and upset stomach. Uh, it's, the immediate form is labeled as PDM, and which refers to the active ingredient fendometrazine. The 35 milligram is to, to prescribed usually two to three times a day to be taken 30 to 60 milligrams before each meal. The sustained release formula, the SR, can be given once a day in a dose of 105 milligrams. I usually start with that. And it's taken about 30 to 60 minutes uh, before each meal. I often give it in people with failed fentamine. A lot of people do better on this than on the fentamine. Some people don't do well on either of them. Some do, do okay on both of them. Um, but this would be another option. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find. The pharmacies don't always, always stock this, but they can order for you or you can find a different pharmacy. Okay, the next one is called uh, Cosima, which is a combination of fentramine plus Topamax. There's four different doses here. The lowest dose only has 15 milligrams of fentramine. Well, I said the regular dose of fentramine that I give is 37.5 milligrams. So it's quite much lower dose of fentramine. Um, it's uh, last we checked, it was $629 a month. So it's quite expensive. It's a mixture of two medications, fentramine, but lower doses, which decreases appetite and topamax or topiramate, which is used to treat seizure, migraine headaches. Um, to, that also has been found to um, make you hungrier, you feel fuller sooner. Common side effects include constipation, dizziness, dry mouth, taste changes, especially with carbonated beverages tingling in your hands and feet, trouble sleeping. But the most important one is the Topamax gives you what's called Stupamax. It can really affect your memory. Um, I don't really see any advantages over fentramine. It's more expensive. It's lower dose of fentramine. The Topamax, I don't think it helps you at all. Um, so I don't really give this one too much. Okay, let's go on to the next category of medicines. These are called the GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. These are what's called an incretin, which I'll show you, which I'll explain in a second. This was discovered about 60 years ago. They found out that they gave people oral glucose. It raised their insulin more than giving them IV glucose. So they thought there was some kind of gastrointestinal factor that secretes insulin. Again, the oral glucose did something in the intestine to give you more insulin. And they were found to be two hormones. One is called GLP-1 receptor, the receptor GLP-1, glucone-like peptide, and one is called gastrointestinal peptide. Um, and they later found that there's GLP-1 receptors in the brain that control appetite. So there's receptors both in the um, intestine and the beta cell, but especially in the brain, and that seems to control appetite. So in a hyperglycemic state, uh, you know, if you have high blood sugars, your GLP-1 receptor agonists, these medicines, stimulate insulin secretion. They give you more insulin. 
And it also delays gastric emptying, which allows the food to stay around slower. It's more even. You don't get a bolus of insulin. You don't get a bolus of glucose when you eat your food. It's more delayed. And these are the two incretin effects. In uh, hyperglycemia states or euglycemia states, it suppresses glucagon secretion. Um, this would also um, tend to lower your blood sugar, uh, but especially decreases your appetite and reduces your body weight. This is um, a picture of what GLP-1 does. When you eat, it gets released and it gets released from the intestine. It stimulates the beta cells, enhances glucose dependent. You know, if your glucose is high, you secrete insulin. If your glucose is not high, you don't secrete insulin. So therefore you don't get hypoglycemia from this. It decreases your glucagon secretion. So that also raises your blood sugar, glucagon does. So you get less uh, raise of your blood sugar. It acts in the brain to promote satiety. You feel full and you reduce your appetite. It decreases your beta cells so they don't have to work as hard, which helps prevent progression to diabetes. Um, it affects glucagon and decreases the glucose output from the liver, hepatic glucose output, and it helps to regulate gastric emptying. So the main drug that is used mostly, and I use it the most, is called semaglutide or ozempic. This is a diabetes medicine that leads to fairly profound and sustained weight loss. It's not like amphetamine, so people that have high side effects on fentamine or fentamethamine are likely to tolerate the ozempic quite well. Um, the uh, side effect is very common is nauseousness. More than probably half the people get some kind of nauseousness. The first trick is to start slow and go up. Um, you can also feel full, um, feel like food stuck in your throat, constipation, diarrhea, uh, bloating are all common things. And you start with a 0.25 milligram weekly for a month and 0.5 milligram weekly for a month and one milligram weekly. If you go up too fast, I guarantee you you're gonna get the nauseousness. So it's really important to go up slowly. And the other trick I like about Ozempic that's not present in the Wagovi or the Majuro is it has clicks. And you click it each time, 18 clicks is 0.25 milligrams. 36 clicks or so is the 0.5 milligrams, 78 clicks is the one milligram. The 18 clicks is 0.25 milligrams. So if you start at 0.25 milligrams and get nauseousness, first of all, you can sort of wait it out, don't give your second dose until the nauseousness goes away, but you can go down on the number of clicks. So if you get nauseousness, uh, you can go down to say uh, five clicks or 10 clicks and then gradually go up by five clicks a week. I also give patients in Zofram, which gets dissolved in your tongue. It's called Zofram ODT. That helps with the nauseousness. I usually get four milligram doses. Uh, more recently, the two milligram dose has been approved. So you can go up from the one milligram dose to the two milligram dose to get an extra weight loss. Um, I usually recommend the two milligram dose be given every 10 days for the first two doses. So rather than every week, skip it out to 10 days and then you should do fine on it. Then you can have to do two doses of the two milligram dose, you can go to every week. So again, this one is uh, 0.25 milligrams a week for a month, 0.5 milligrams a week for a month and one milligram weekly. And then eventually you can go up to two milligrams. So if a nauseous is severe, stop the ozempic until the nauseousness resolves. Then we start and say eight clicks or 10 clicks and go up by five clicks every two weeks is tolerated. The weight loss is higher at greater at higher doses, but you still, many people still get a nice amount of weight loss at a lower dose. There's not that much difference in weight loss between the one milligram and two milligram doses. Other side effects include vomiting, uh, diarrhea, constipation, feeling full, food stuck in your mouth, uh, loss of appetite. Um, Ozempic lowers your hemoglobin A1C, but only doesn't have much of an effect if it's already low. So if you have a high A1C, you'll bring it down. If you have a low one, you won't get hypoglycemia from it. It has very uh, significant cardiovascular protective effects. It has some kidney effects, uh, probably has some effects in fatty liver disease, affects PCOS. Um, so it really is a, a very wonderful medication. It is a shot that's once a week with a small needle, very easy to give yourself, but you don't need anyone else to give it to you. Um, you can, uh, it just takes a couple of minutes to give, to give it to yourself. Um, and again, it doesn't give low blood sugars. However, it's an expensive medicine. Um, the price can be without insurance, I think up to $900. In places in Canada, we can get it for about $300 a month. Um, so people should check with their insurance to see if it's covered for Ozempic. Um, it's generally approved for diabetes, uh, but some insurances allow it to be both out diabetes. Uh, Wagovi, which I'll talk about in the next slide, is used for weight loss. They need to find out what the approval process is, and then you can get it at a lower cost from Canadian pharmacies if that seems to be the best option.
Now, the next, uh, the, the other term that people use, the other drug is called Wagovi. Wagovi is the same drug, semaglutide, as Ozempic. It's only approved for weight loss drug, and it doesn't, it's a pen that doesn't allow the clicking. So it has that disadvantage, you're sort of stuck with one dose on it. It comes as 0.25 milligrams, 0.5 milligrams, 1 milligram, 1.7 milligrams, and 2.4 milligrams. And you should stay on each dose for a month before you go up to the next, especially if you're not, if you're having side effects. Um, however, there's a shortage of this medicine. Um, it's basically pretty unavailable except at the starting doses. So they don't want new people to start it because they don't have enough. You know, this, everybody blames supply chain issues. This is another one that was blamed on supply chain issues. Um, the one milligram, the 1.7, the 2.4 milligram doses are somewhat available. You may have to check with your pharmacy, but they should be okay. So in theory, somebody can go on the Zempic and go up to the one milligram dose and then switch over to the Wagovi and have their insurance covered. It's supposed to be more available in December. The side effects are similar to Ozempic with the uh, nauseousness, um, et cetera. And the third one is called Revelsis. Revelsis is also the same drug. It's also semaglutide. It's a pill though. It's approved for diabetes. It comes in seven and 14 milligrams. They should stay on the seven milligram dose for a month before they go up to the 14 milligrams. But it doesn't give as much weight loss as the um, Ozempic does. And I think not too many people use it because the Ozempic or the Wagovi is pretty easy to use with a shot. You know, unless somebody really has a phobia to needles, you can go with the Ozempic. The Ozempic seems to work a little bit better. Okay, so the newest one is called Monjuro. Monjaro, I guess. It's called terzapatide. Um, it's a diabetes drug that was heavily researched. There was probably about six or eight papers in the New England Journal about it. I did a journal club on it, or I had my resident do a journal club on it last year uh, before it got approved. So I knew a lot about it before it was coming out. It's called a dual incretin. Remember I mentioned the incretins are GLP-1 and GIP gastrointestinal peptide. This has properties, so it binds to both the GLP-1 receptors in both the... Um, in the um, brain and the uh, beta cell and the intestines. Um, and um, the GIP, one, GIP molecule that also can suppress your weight and help with your diabetes. It's only approved for diabetes currently. It's not approved for weight loss, but uh, we can get around that. Very impressive weight loss properties in patients on the highest dose have been losing on an average of 25 pounds. I'll show that on the next slide. It's given once a week like Ozempic, has similar side effects as Ozempic, nauseousness, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting, constipation, indigestion, uh, abdominal pain. The doses are 2.5, 5, 7.5, 10, 12.5, and 15. It's in a single dose pen. So you, again, you don't have that option of clicks and you just use the pen up once and throw it away. Um, you should stay on the same dose for four weeks and only go up to a higher dose if no side effects are present. The good news is because this is a new medicine, I don't think it's gonna last too long, but there's a $25 copay at Manjuro.com saving you slash dot, uh, hyphen resources. But if you go onto Manjuro.com, you can find it. Um, it's $25 for one month without insurance coverage. If you have insurance coverage and you must, you know, you can use your insurance or if you have insurance coverage, you can probably get the Ozempic. But if you don't have insurance and you don't, if we don't process you for insurance, it's only $25 for one month. So it's not that, it's pretty inexpensive compared to some of the other medicines. And this is why it's called a twin cretin or twin incretin. It binds to both the GIP receptors and G glucagon like PEPR1. Um, it's, uh, when I made this slide, it was in development, but now it's approved um, and it lowers glucose and enhances um, glucose, some of the insulin effects. And this is an article from the New England Journal of last, um, I think it came out maybe last October, 2021. And I'll highlight the figure, figure B, the change in body weight with dose. So the dots here, the top line here are Ozempic semiglutide at the one milligram dose. You know, nice impressive weight loss, 6.2 kilograms, which is about, uh, you know, maybe 16 pounds or so. And then here is the dose at the five milligram dose, still better than the semiglutide, the 10 milligram dose and the 15 milligram. The 15 milligram dose, it was a 12.4 kilogram, which is about a 30 pound uh, weight loss. Uh, quite impressive. And it, the people dropped from the baseline weight 13%. And really, this is better than any other weight loss medicine we've had. Um, the people lost the tech, met their weight loss target was pretty good. Change in lipids was quite good. All in all, this was a very impressive medicine and a very impressive paper. 
Uh, the next medicine to talk about is Sexenda. It's also called liraglutide. The version for diabetes is called Victosa. The version for obesity is called Sexenda. This is approved for obesity. From what I understand, the sales rep for this came by to my office a couple of days ago and said this is more readily covered by insurance than other ones. It's a three milligram shot, shot, but it's daily, not weekly, it's daily. So therefore it's much less convenient. There's also a savings card on sexsenda.com. Um, this has been more likely than the Ozempic to give people pancreatitis. If you have a history of pancreatitis, you probably shouldn't use it. It gives a rare type of thyroid tumor in animals. That's probably not too important to people. Um, but um, the pancreatitis seems to be a little more of a side effect. But the issues of the vomiting, nauseousness, all those issues are present with this one. So this is another one you can check with your insurance about. Okay, I'm going to go on to Contrave. Contrave is a mixture of naltrexone and bupropion. Naltrexone is used to treat alcohol and drug dependence. Uh, people use the, the low-dose naltrexone. This is a higher dose. The low-dose naltrexone is given by some alternative doctors and maybe some rheumatologists, things like that, to help with uh, some, uh, some type of inflammation type of conditions. It's the combination of that plus bupropion. Bupropion is either used for to treat depression or help people quit smoking. People feel less hungry or, full, or fuller sooner. Side effects include constipation, diarrhea, dizziness, dry mouth, headache, increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, insomnia, liver damage, nauseousness, and vomiting. It also may increase suicidal thoughts, although that's not been too common. I really don't give this one too much either. I think there's other medicines that are better, and this is also fairly expensive. Now, another reasonable option that's, I think, underutilized, and you'll see why a little bit is uh, why it's underutilized, but it's an okay option. It's called Orlistat. The generic medicine you can get without a prescription called Ollie. It's about $53 a month, I think, for the uh, Orlistat. The Ollie might be a little bit more. Um, the Orlistat dose is 120 milligrams three times a day with meals. The Ollie dose is 60 milligrams three times a day with meals, but you can probably take two pills three times a day. It works in your intestine to reduce the amount of fat your body absorbs from the foods you eat. So the side effects are diarrhea, gas, leaky, oily stools, and stomach pain. These are not pleasant side effects that are fairly common with this medicine. So I think because of the side effect profile, it's also not that widely used. But you know, the people that don't tolerate the um, Ozempic type of medicines and don't tolerate the fentramine type of medicines, um, I have given this in some of those patients. Some of them you know, wrote through the side effects without much problem and did lose a fair amount of weight on this. It's also recommended to take a multivitamin to ensure you get certain vitamins that your body may not absorb from the foods you eat. Okay, the really important question is how do you get insurance coverage? These are expensive medicines. So people can call their insurance up. I recommend people doing that before they even ask us what, uh, what they recommend. Insurances widely vary on what they cover. Some insurances don't cover weight loss medicines at all. They just say, we just don't believe in it, you know? whatever reason, go, you know, work on diet and exercise. Um, and that's the case, you know, sort of no amount of appealing is going to help if they say we just don't cover it. Others will cover these medicines for uh, diabetes, but not for obesity. And some may uh, cover it for obesity. So you want to ask them what the coverage is and what if they have a pre-auth form, some of them do it with cover me meds, some of them do it other ways. Um, you want to say specifically ask about Zempic, does it cover it with for if you don't have diabetes? If you have diabetes, it's probably easier to get it covered. Uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes, PCOS, does all do they cover for any of those? Most of the time, the answer is no, but uh, sometimes it may be yes. Um, if, you, if you're not covered, appeals or face-to-face -face phone calls are unlikely to be successful. So therefore, I think for most people, the, one of the best options if their insurance doesn't cover these is the Manjuro. The Manjuro, again, is the $25 a month copay. Um, it's a good medicine, doesn't need a pre-authorization, and uh, works for at least probably as well as uh, the Ozempic. Uh, with a similar side effect profile. The next question people ask is how long do you take need to take these medicines? Um, and I think there's, um, depends on the medicine, but I think the answer is basically until you get side effects. Most people don't get the side effects long-term. They get the side effects at the beginning and sort of ride them out and they, then they get better. Um, until you get your ideal body weight. I had a patient that went down from about 200 to 145 on the Ozempic very uh, star patient from Chicago, but she says she wants to get to 135 pounds. That was her target weight. And, uh, you know, for her height, that's uh, what she should weigh at. So we kept her on, and even though she's already lost 45 pounds, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, I guess. And um, so she's staying on the medicine. Um, 
So I think the GLP-1 receptor agonists seem to keep on working. You don't get tolerant to them that much, but you know, probably a touch. And you could saw that graph we have from the Juro. The weight loss did taper down a little bit with time. The Fenchme usually stops working in three to six months. If you take the Fenchme, you could take a holiday and then restart it, then it often works again. You can try mixing and matching, try the GLP-1 receptors for a while and then go off them and go back to the fentramine and then go back onto GLP-1 receptor agonists. They're all different combinations. And I think as these medicines get more widely approved, um, they're gonna be a lot more fine tuning how you take them together. You take one and they take a holiday. Um, there's some thought just that you know, you'll get a rebound waking when you stop it. Um, it's not that clear that's been looked at that carefully in the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, I think that many people find that they're just not that hungry even if they stop it and their, you know, their appetite is shrunk and their stomach is shrunk. Um, so many people don't have a rebound once they um, stop it. So I think this is the most important slide. And I was thinking about how to really integrate this whole talk and I think a slide tries to do it. So how do you work this with diet and exercise? Um, and I'll talk about this uh, lecture I heard and, um, this idea about, uh, you know, the, the, you want to curb your appetite. It's better to eat less foods than more foods. Um, a lot of, especially processed foods, a lot of processed foods have a lot of toxic things in them. Um, the, um, the Dr. Means' lecture we'll talk about in a second. You know, she commented that foods have high fructose corn syrup and if that gets you to eat more, gets you to crave more foods. Um, it doesn't help you with your satiety. There's a lot of plastics and other byproducts of foods in processed foods. If you eat healthy foods on the ground, you don't get this. Um, but I think in general, people should can eat less and they'll do better. I don't. I think this idea about you need to eat to keep your um, energy up, I don't think that's really true. I think people who eat less have more energy, not people who eat more have more energy. It's a little paradoxical there. Um, so if you can curb your appetite, you'll put less toxic foods in your body. Um, your food is expensive, no, clearly. It's time consuming to prepare it, go shopping, wash the vegetables, all those things. So if you can eat half the amount of food and do the same, you'll save money, you'll save time, allows you to do, spend your time doing other things. So I sort of think about, you know, this seems sort of naive or basic, simple, but I think it's a big factor. If you can really cut down your foods, you'll do better. A lot of studies have shown that, you know, both intermittent fasting and general food restriction, the people that eat less, uh, less calories do usually live the longest allows people to jumpstart their diet. You know, you're stuck on your diet. You go on this medicine and you start losing the weight and your diet's easier. It decreases cravings. Um, you're less hungry for unhealthy foods. It decreases insulin resistance. Obviously, people feel better when they have less weight. It's good for their self-esteem. They can move easier. They have less inflammation. The fat makes inflammatory hormones. Um, it's easier to exercise if you're thinner. And if you have more energy, um, I think people do in general get more energy from these medicines, not less energy. Um, it helps your uh, gut, your gut health, your microbiome goes down if you start losing weight and you eat or healthy your foods and not eating the uh, processed foods. And with that in mind, I want to talk about um, a rabbi that I am a big fan of. His name is Maimonides. Maimonides always believed in moderation. I think that's what he's known for, and I believe in moderation too. Maimonides, uh, who was one of the greatest ancient physicians and philosophers, happened to be a rabbi. He was known as Maimonides or Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. He lived from 1135 to 1204, so about 800 years ago, and he wrote about nutrition and health over 800 years, and his uh, teachings have stood the test of time. We've gotten better with time. Here are 14 bits of wisdom from Monies who wrote about all the relevant medical, nutritional, philosophical teachings of his times. Number one, you should eat only when you're hungry and drink only when you're thirsty. Over, number two, overeating is like poison to the body and can lead to illness. So cut down on your overeating. The preservation of health lies in the abstinence and abstaining from satiation. So you should not eat to be over full, to be stuffed. You should eat to be, so you're just no longer hungry. Even somebody eats exercise regularly become obese if he constantly eats refined bread, like shown over here. Flour that has been sifted over here so well that no bran, the bran is the darker parts that give it a whole wheat, the whole wheat color. If it's sifted so much that the bran doesn't remain as an unhealthy food and should not be eaten in quantity. If wine is consumed, as in the middle picture here, it is a major factor in the preservation of health and the cure of many illnesses. So my mind is recommended moderation of wine. I agree with that. Wine has a lot of antioxidants in it. 
Okay, the uh, next one is number seven. One of the most powerful forces of human nature is habit, irrespective of whether these are actions or perceptions. For instance, you may choose bad foods, which you're accustomed to, over good foods to which you're not accustomed, even though it's not the correct choice. Uh, so you want to think about the right way to eat, think about foods and not the wrong way. Um, if you do exercise, if you did not do exercise, you will suffer from pain and depleted energy levels. Even the correct foods are eaten and all the rules of medicine are followed. Exercise is a crucial factor, as Mamani has said. The most beneficial hours of sleep are the eight hours until sunrise. So try to sleep, say, between 11 and 7 is a good choice. 12 to 6, I'm um, sorry, 10 to 6 is a good choice. Uh, those eight hours are good. Getting enough sleep is crucial. One may, one must, number 10, one must pay constant attention and constantly consider one's emotional activities. Maintaining them in equilibrium during health and illness must take precedent over any other regimen. Constant anxiety damages the body. So all these are crucial issues that have been uh, proven with time. Number 12, it is human nature to be influenced by your environment. You should only associate with people who have a positive, will have a positive influence. So general people that are Losing weight should be and trying to be healthy should be around other people that are trying to be healthy and trying to lose weight. Accept the truth from whatever source it, source it comes. And the last one, number 14, let a person replace stress and anxiety with hope. So be a positive person and be optimistic. Mamani's maintained that the whole person must be treated and not just the symptoms of illness. You didn't call the doctor when you're sick. You went to a doctor to discuss your general state of health and psychological well-being. If you are sick, the doctor would examine your eating habits, fitness levels, and emotional state of mind. The cause of illness was first discussed before the symptoms were diagnosed and treated. Mind-body balance was maintained in both times of illness and health. And I think in 2020, uh, 2022, uh, the Jewish New Year just started, 5783, we should all practice what Maimonides advocated. And then finally, I want to close with re reference an amazing podcast. I really like Barry Weiss. I think she does great, great podcasts. Um, this is the link to the podcast, and this is the, uh, the barcode for this podcast. It's available on apple.com, other podcast places. And it was called Eating Ourselves to Death. And it had a doctor named Dr. Casey Means. Dr. Means is a Stanford-trained physician who was also at Ohio State University. Um, she did her, was in her fifth year of residency in ENT, ear, nose, and throat, and realized her patients weren't getting better. They were kept on getting sick. They had multiple diseases that each specialist tried to examine, whether it was uh, heartburn or diabetes or obesity or heart disease or high blood pressure or stroke. Each specialist looked at each one separately, would give, do a bunch of tests and give uh, certain medicines to try to figure out that, um, that disease, but nobody would look at the whole picture. And she felt, and I think she's right, that most of the picture has to do with poor eating habits, pre-diabetes and diabetes, spikes in sugar. Um, and she thinks the bad food that we eat is part of the, uh, the problem here. So I really recommend this podcast. It's about an hour and a half. It's really good. Dr. Means has a website called levelshealth.com. The link for it is right down at the bottom there. Uh, it's a really good website. I recommend going on, getting uh, subscribing to the newsletter if you want. Uh, Levels.health and Dr. Means uh, approach is balanced approach to wellness and weight loss. Eat natural, unprocessed foods. Processed foods have a lot of toxins and chemicals such as high fructose corn syrup. The high fructose corn syrup gets people to eat more and it's just a vicious cycle. A lot of these are designed by the food companies. They want to figure out how people can eat more of their products. They put unhealthy things in it that cause people to crave sugar and salt, and they just end up eating more. Dr. Means advocates moving, exercise, good night's sleep, preserve the circadian rhythm. Sleep at night, not during the day, get some sunlight during the day. Good mental health is crucial. The microbiome or the gut health is important. She feels that, this I think I'm pretty sure it's true. NSAIDs like Motrin and, and and, um, and um, ibuprofen, antibiotics all affect the microbiome, the gut health. She uses what I use a lot for my diabetes patients. I don't use this for obesity patients, um, um, but um, these are called continuous glucose monitors. Um, they, um, you can sign up to get them on her, uh, on her um, 
a website. I think there's a waiting list, but you can sign up for them. Um, and they monitor how food spiked your blood sugars. So her idea is you listen to a commercial and the, the commercial says, you know, Cheerios is made with whole, whole, whole oats. It uh, helps you prevent diabetes, but it really doesn't. And it, for you, it might raise your sugars a lot. So you can do your testing yourself what foods help with your sugar, blood sugars levels with this continuous glucose monitor. So I'm not sure how, you know, for everybody, this continuous glucose monitor is a good idea. You can um, go on her website and look a little bit more about it. But I think it's a fascinating idea about how uh, we need to avoid spikes in blood sugar levels. We should try to avoid diabetes and prediabetes, avoid obesity, and do these common sense things that Bomani's recommended and I recommended, Dr. Means recommended. So I'm going to post the uh, website in a couple of days at goodhormonehealth.com. Um, somebody mentioned they couldn't get on the link. I'm pretty sure the link's okay, but you can try it again. Uh, please email us at the mail at Good Hormone Health if you want to make an appointment or go on my website, goodhormonehealth.com um, to make an appointment. And we can open up for questions, I think. Let's see. Okay, so now I let people unmute themselves. They can either unmute themselves on the, um, or ask the questions in the chat. Let me start with the chat. Um, so Sarah asked, do some people not respond to these meds? Yes, so I think the medicines are individualized. Some people respond better than other ones. Some people, you have to try one, it doesn't work, you try another one. Um, again, I mentioned sort of the two sort of categories, the fentramine type of medicines, the GLP-1 receptors. Some people respond better to others. Some people have side effects. So, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody, certainly. Uh, Amy says, how do these drugs affect hypothyroid patients? So basically, um, hypothyroidism um, is, can often be better if you lose weight. So you, you might need less medicines. So a lot of thyroid medicine is, depends on how much you weigh. A thinner person will need less of your medicine. So you should not constantly adjust your medicines. Also, these medicines, uh, the weight loss decreases the fat, sort of decreases inflammation. So some of your Hashi, Hashimoto's may get better uh, with time. I don't know what Golo is. You can ask me uh, to explain more what Golo is. Uh, Sarah says, I was on Ozempic. I switched to Manjura because I heard Ozempic was going to be a national storage like Wagovi. Do you know anything about the Ozempic supply? I think it's, it's, it's fairly tight, but I think it's pretty readily available still. Um, and I presume I'm sure there's probably going to be a shortage of two because these medicines are extremely popular. Uh, doctors are prescribing them a lot. They're not prescribing fentramine. They're prescribing these. And, um, I, you know, right now there's a uh, thick is fairly available. Um, but, um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, I think they're going to start ramping up the production of all these medicines. And I think it'll probably get better with time. Uh, Sybil says, I do my fitness pal. I actually have to eat more. Appetite is an issue. Well, Zempix is the best option. Yes. So I was going to bring that up. So some, most people, a lot of people say they don't eat that much, but I think they still crave a little bit. They don't eat the healthiest foods. Um, they may not eat at the right time. Um, so I think um, I think even if you don't eat that much, you can still, these medicines still help you. You can still eat less. Um, I haven't been, I haven't found one patient really that tolerated the medicine, but didn't lose weight. Most people don't tolerate the medicine and then stop it. But the people that do, they can tolerate it, can get, um, can get weight loss, um, even if they don't eat that much. Amy asked, do these drugs interact with other prescriptions? As far as I know, not really too much. You know, obviously the fentamine, you want to be cautious of that if you're taking another stimulant like Adderall or Ritalin. Um, the Ozempic seems to be pretty good. Um, you know, I think if you are taking another diabetes medicine, you can get more low blood sugars than if you're taking the other diabetes medicine alone. Um, it doesn't give you that much low blood sugars by itself, but it does um, um, it does give um, some, um, could give some hypoglycemia if you're already on a diabetes medicine, especially something like glimipramide or sulfonylurea. Uh, Susan asks, I have rheumatoid arthritis as well as growth hormone exchange deficiency. I'm tapering off prednisone when I take a biological, as opposed to start Ozempic, uh, Rebelsis over Ozempic. I would do Ozempic over Rebelsis. Um, I think uh, Ozempic just works better. Um, I think you also have the, the flexibility with the clicks and digesting the dose and up dosing it. Um, the general, the weight loss is better with Ozempic. And unless you have a severe needle phobia, I would say um, go, go for the Ozempic over the, over the Revelsis. Um, Amy asks about modafinil, provigil, and Adderall. 
These are none of these are weight loss medicines, but can give you a little bit of weight loss. Most of these are uh, stimulants. Um, the modifinol and the provigil are frequently used for narcolepsy. Adderall is used both for ADHD. Pituitary patients often respond well to Adderall and Ritalin. Um, so these are also options that do give you some weight loss medicines. I guess I could have included them in the talk today, but I um, um, I focused on the real weight loss medicines. Okay, is there anything to help with the abdominal pain, nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea of Manjuro? Just cut down the dose, basically, or you know, don't take the take it less frequently. Um, presumably, that, that's the disadvantage of Manjuro versus the uh, Ozempic, because you can't do the clicks. So I presume you, uh, Andrea is on the lowest dose, the 0.25 milligrams. Um, she could try to spill out a little bit from the syringe. In theory, she can try to take it every two weeks instead of every um, um, every uh, week. I interesting. I have some people the other way around. I have some people take the Ozempic, the one milligram dose. They take a half a milligram twice a week instead of the one milligram dose every week. Um, so that's an option to try. Cassandra says, if somebody, if someone is still in the process of being diagnosed with a, with ruling out an endocrine disorder, is okay to start the weight loss drug? Um, I, I think it depends on where you're at. Your workup. Um, you know, I think if you're doing a Christian's workup and you're sort of um, in the middle of the workup and, you know, it's going to go on for a long time. I think you can probably start on one of these. Um, you know, if you're a lot of people, like people know I put on ketoconazole for their Cushing's. I want to see how their weight loss is. I probably wouldn't start this when I start the ketoconazole because I want to see whether the weight loss is due to the keto versus due to the, uh, the medicine. And um, would the medicine be less effective? I think it probably would. I mean, I think Cushing's disease should, um, should sort of override the effects of the medicine. You probably won't lose much weight if you really have Cushing's. Although maybe not, you know, people, um, people with Cushing's, they have some of them, not all of them. Some of them have a low appetite. Some of them have a high appetite. Some of them um, eat a lot and then maybe the medicine might be effective. Sarah, yes, you have concerns about long-term effects of the medicine since they are new. Um, I think they're quite safe and they've been around, the uh, Ozempic has been around, I think about five years. Um, then it was based on one called, um, um, by Durian or by Etta, that was all around for another five years before that. Um, I think there have been so many studies and so many people, I think they're fairly safe. Uh, the Manjuro is newer, maybe there's a little more concern about that, but it was still given trials to thousands of people. Alexandra says, Would you prescribe any of these medicines alongside ketoconazole? Um, you know, I think I'd want to see how the ketoconazole is working already. You have somebody that the ketoconazole is working, their cortisol symptoms are better, but they still are overweight. And um, then I think I would add the, um, the one of these medicines, it could be. Um, you know, let's say a person's target weight is um, 150 and they weigh 300 and they have Cushing's. That person's probably, even if their Cushing's are completely cured, they're probably not going to get down to 150. So I think a good, you know, you adding the keto or putting someone, you know, giving someone surgery with Cushing's and giving her these medicines would be a good combination. Lisa says my A1C was 5.6 and has been trending higher over the past year. Can this be covered by Medicaid if you're not diabetic or pre-diabetic? I think you need to ask your insurance uh, about this. Um, in general, um, you know, insurances uh, have different plans and different, even different Medicare has different coverages. Um, it does a conflict with thyroid center MP thyroid? No, it should not. The only thing is if you start losing weight, you may need a lower dose of your thyroid center MP thyroid. Heidi asks, um, I was prescribed will go before weight, law, weight gain resulting from Christian disease, panopatitis, and hypothyroidism. Did some resistance, any specific intervention or recommendations I need? They'll get insurance to approve it. In general, the um, insurance seems to have criteria. You know, um, they either approve it or they don't approve it. They have a list of things. And usually the, the begging um, probably doesn't help too much. Uh, you can try. Um, but it just seems like they have a list of either they cover it or they don't. And again, Wagovi has a little bit of a shortage right now, um, especially if you're starting. I don't think you can get readily, certainly not the 0.25 milligrams or the 0.5 milligram dose. If someone tests negative for all other endocrine conditions and makes good food choices, what causes so much weight gain, obesity, inflammation? That's a good question. I mean, you know, we have half of our society is um, obese. Is it due to the environment? Is it due to toxins in the environment? It's just so much foods available, um, you know, so much advertising is available. Um, you know, people have people have studied uh, causes of obesity for uh, decades, and um, it's not an easy answer. But it, obesity is quite common. Um, I think these medicines are helpful for it. Um, cutting down your food, cutting down your inflammation, eating natural foods, exercising more—all those are good choices. 
for somebody who's um, still struggling with weight. Um, it's hard. Marlene asked, do you have recommendations for sticking to a certain diet, for example, low carb or plant-based, low fat versus high fat keto? Um, I believe in the vegetable diet. Um, it's on my website, vegetable revolution diet. I think people should fill up on vegetables. It's easier to tell people what to eat than what not to eat. So I encourage people to eat a lot of vegetables, low carbs, and you know, sort of a moderate around the protein, fairly low fat, I would recommend. Um, I don't rec really like these high fat diets. Um, Plant is good, uh, certainly, um, but don't eat a lot of starches. Um, you know, so really uh, low, high vegetables and low carbs. And you also want to stick with a diet you stick with. You know, the people that say diet doesn't work for me, I've been on a thousand diets for each of them for a week. That's probably not a good philosophy. Really try to stick with the diet, such as the high vegetable diet or low carb diet for a long time. S. Mikhailovich says, I've been on different growth hormone medications for, for about four years due to the tumor and panhypertourism. I have to rotate medications because of lack of insurance coverage. This has helped me feel a ton better, thinking I'll have a rebound weekend if I cannot continue with growth hormone. I wondered then if I might be a candidate for weight loss medicine instead. And I think that would be, uh, it's good. But, you know, if you're truly growth hormone deficient, you should be on growth hormone. Um, you know, one way or another, um, the um, insurance companies try to weasel the way out of it, uh, but, you know, try to stick with it and be on growth hormone if you need it, and then you can do an adjunct to the, um, the weight loss medicines. Any contradictions with these medicines, certain diseases, the only thing is this medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, which is super rare. That is a contradiction for it. I think somebody that has active pancreatitis, I wouldn't give the medicines to. People have a condition called gastroparesis, where they don't uh, swallow foods properly, get stuck in their throat. They have slow gastric emptying. Probably wouldn't give it with those. People that have a lot of already sort of GI nauseousness, diarrhea issues, I probably wouldn't give it with those. Um, medicines, um, I think medicines are mostly okay with these medicines, except for the fentramine and the interactions with something like um, um, the Adderall and also the fentramine. Some people give the anxiety. So if somebody has a lot of anxiety, I might not give them uh, fentramine. Multiple sclerosis should be okay. I don't know what Tisabri is. I missed the weight loss options. Can you post again? Sure. Okay, so here's the main list of medicines. Uh, fentramine. Fentramine, fentametrosine, tenuate, which is similar to fentametrosine. Cosima, Zempic, Revelsis, Wagovi, Majuro, Liraglutide, Delaglutide, Naltrexone, Von Propion, and Orlistat. MS disease modifying drugs, I think this should be okay. Certainly ask your MS doctor about it, but I don't see any problem. My um, daughter has myotonic dystrophy and she's been on Zempic and has lost about uh, 25 pounds or so. And I think her myotonic dystrophy has gotten better. I think her muscle strength has improved. Uh, I haven't done a, a large enough study on it, but uh, I think the people with neurological problems, they may also get better on this. Okay, any other questions? You know why Majuro seems to be less costly? I think it's just a newer drug. I think it's, it's just not as widely known about and used. It only came out in uh, January. My guess is it'll probably go up in cost. Uh, it'll probably be more expensive because it's uh, probably a little harder to make and um, it gives it more weight loss. Uh, Sarah asked, you know, if these medicines can help with inflammation, neurological symptoms of Lyme disease. I don't know about that, but... Um, it's possible they do um, seem to be, you know, by reducing the fat, fat makes inflammation um, and um, it's possible they may help with neurological symptoms.
Okay, so I will. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, everybody. So we'll post this in a couple of days, and um, I'll have. I think we'll do another uh, webinar in a couple of months. Thank you, everybody. Um, probably going to do something with um, this group. That's sort of um, sort of all a group of alternative medicine doctors. Next time, we're working on that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.